grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I imagine that if you're like me, uh, you probably thought quite a lot, uh, quite a number of times before, about what it must have been like to be there among Jesus' closest followers during those approximately three years of his public ministry on earth, uh, to have been able to, to be there, to, to be eyewitness to those amazing miracles that he performed, to, to hear his powerful teaching, to see the, the look in his eyes, the look of, of tenderness and compassion, mercy and care as he responded to the needs of the people around him, especially the, the needs of the sick and the, the lame and blind and crippled who came to him or who were brought to him for healing. Maybe it probably certainly also would have been interesting to, to be there to hear Jesus uh, harshly rebuke as well those, those hypocritical religious leaders of the day who were only really focused on uh, putting on a good face for others to honor them and, and to, to praise them for their good works and, and their outward obedience to God's command. It would have been interesting to see Jesus interacting with the tax collectors and the, the sinners, the outcasts of society of his day, reaching out to them in, in mercy and love. On a, on a particular occasion that uh, the Apostle John records for us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit here in John chapter 10, we see Jesus there in Jerusalem in the, the temple courtyard for uh, the festival that is now called Hanukkah, the festival commemorating the cleansing and rededication of the temple after it was um, conquered and, and profaned by the pagan king Antiochus IV Epiphanes. So the Jews, uh, Jesus among them, celebrated that festival, giving thanks to God for allowing the temple and its worship to be restored and, and to continue uh, for the proclamation of God's word and for the blessing of God's people. We read that Jesus was there in an area of the temple courtyard, a, a covered walkway, a portico known as Solomon's Colonnade. And we see that uh, some of the Jews probably especially those uh, religious leaders of the Jewish people who did not, uh, for the most part, believe that Jesus is true God, that he is the Messiah, the Savior that God had promised to send. And, and so they came to him and they asked him in verse 24, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now we see from Jesus' answer that it seems that this question, this plea from Jesus for understanding and knowledge was not really a sincere request to, for enlightenment and for understanding. But it was actually really a, a challenge, a, a denunciation, a rebuke of, of Jesus for causing division among the Jewish people as some believe that he is the Savior, but, but they and, and many others do not believe that Jesus is the Savior. And so they... They wanted Jesus to, to get out of the way. They, they wanted him to either come out and, and say that he is the Savior so that they could have that, that open evidence and use that against him because they believed that he was blaspheming God, that he was bringing shame and, and, and scorn upon the name of God by falsely claiming to be God. We see that just shortly be before this challenge uh, to Jesus, Jesus had healed a man who had been blind from birth. And so many of the people who had seen Jesus perform that miracle or, or who knew this man and they had seen him many times, uh, he, had, he had been blind from birth, he had been there begging in the temple courtyard uh, for many years and so he was very familiar to many people. And, and even if there were people who didn't themselves witness that miracle, yet they saw the man after the miracle at least, and they knew it was the same man that they had seen so many times before who was blind and now miraculously healed. And John records for us in the previous chapter, chapter 9, that some of the Pharisees said after Jesus did this miracle, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others were saying, how can a sinful man work such miraculous signs? So there was division among them. And so now we see here in John chapter 10 that 
that this group of Jews came to Jesus and undoubtedly they wanted to expose Jesus as being a fraud and an imposter. And so they put that challenging question to Jesus. And we see Jesus in response handle the, the situation masterfully as he had done so many times before. He replied, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I am doing in my Father's name testify about me. Yes, again and again, Jesus had tried to explain to them the, the, the purpose of his ministry and his mission and the importance of that mission, but they would not listen. They would not believe. Again and again, Jesus had performed miraculous signs to prove to them that what he said about himself is true, that he really is God that he really is the Savior that God had promised to send so many times before, through, through the centuries and millennia before that time. But still, in spite of all of those miracles that he performed, which could only have come from God, so many of them still refused to believe that he is the Savior. And so the real truth was put before, him, before them when Jesus said, You do not believe because you are not my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Maybe you've heard the characterization that sheep are uh, especially stupid animals. Uh, That sometimes, uh, if sheep are not following the shepherd, um, there have been uh, recorded cases of hundreds of sheep following uh, one after another off the edge of a cliff. Um, They're not especially bright animals. But, in spite of that, uh, you can also find many accounts, many stories of, of sheep who clearly recognized and understood and followed their shepherd's voice. Even accounts of of instances where there were multiple flocks of sheep mixed together around a watering hole, and one after another, the individual shepherds would take turns calling for their sheep, and only the sheep from their own flocks would come and follow them and not follow any other shepherd. Yes, in spite of their relatively low intelligence, God has blessed the sheep with that ability to recognize their own shepherd's voice and to be willing to follow the shepherd. That's exactly what Jesus tells us. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. That is what Jesus wants for every person. That's why Jesus came into this world, leaving, uh, temporarily putting aside the full use of his glory and and his majesty as God to be born in in humble and lowly circumstances, to to live in in lowly circumstances, surrounded by sinful people, to to bear the scorn of of people who did not believe in him and, and the torture and abuse that they heaped upon him. That is why Jesus suffered and bled and died. That is why he rose to life, eternal life, life full of glory. But sadly, not everyone wants what Jesus offers, what Jesus has won for us. Not everyone is willing to listen to him and to follow him. Some, sadly, are are determined to go their own way. Jesus taught that there are two masters in life. He talked about God and money, and really money is is just another way of worshiping and serving self and our own desires. So we are either mastered by God and his will for us or or by ourself and our own self-centered and and selfish will for our lives. Who is the Lord of your life? To whom are you listening? Whom are you following? Whose will are you obeying? Maybe you've heard in recent years that there have been some a rather well-known Christian or ostensibly Christian pastors who have publicly stated that either they don't believe that hell exists 
or they don't believe that a loving God would actually send anyone to hell for eternal damnation. Of course, that's an idea that many people have had for a long time, but it used to be that at least Christian pastors were clear on what the Bible says about heaven and hell and and the reality of eternal judgment. However, in spite of, of very many people, including some Christian pastors, claiming that they don't believe in hell, As we reflect on on our culture, uh, we see that there certainly are quite a lot of references to hell in popular culture and in in everyday conversation even. You can probably think off the top of your head of some musical groups that have songs with a specific focus on hell and some popular phrases that are used in, in, in frequent conversation that include the word hell. There's a theory that there are so many references to hell in our contemporary culture because even if people claim that they don't personally believe in the existence of hell, yet there's there's something in, in their subconscious mind that still makes them afraid that they will end up in hell. And so they make frequent frequent references to hell as a as a way to pretend that they are not afraid of it, again at at least subconsciously. Well, of course, we know the truth of what God's Word says, that hell is real. And we know that God's Word also says that everyone has a conscience, a voice inside their minds or their hearts that makes them feel guilty when they sin, and that reminds them yet that, yes, there is a God who is righteous and just and who will punish the guilty with suffering in hell apart from faith in Jesus as Savior. Those who listen to the devil and who follow his ways, those who who refuse to repent of their sins and to trust in Jesus as their Savior, tragically, they will suffer the agony of hell. The Bible describes hell as a place of unquenchable fire, always burning but never being burned up, a place of utter darkness, total separation from the light and, and love of God, place of of eternal death, always dying, but again, never totally destroyed. Hell is is death to the spirit, death to the soul, complete separation from God and, and all grace and blessing from him. The Bible refers to this as the second death. And yes, hell and its utter horror are very real. And that is why Jesus came. He doesn't want people to listen to the devil, to to follow the devil to hell. He doesn't want people to suffer death, especially that second death. He came so that all people may have life, eternal life. He wants us to enjoy that life with him in heaven. However, again, tragically, Not everyone does enjoy that life because not everyone listens to him and believes in him as the Savior. Jesus said very clearly that he is the only way to that eternal life in heaven. John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are you listening to Jesus? Are you one of his sheep? Jesus said, again, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Those who listen to Jesus, those who believe in him and follow him, will enjoy eternal life, he promises to us. They will have the pleasure of heaven, that perfect peace, that perfect joy and harmony there in the presence of God, together with all other believers of the past and of the present and of the future, together with all the holy angels of God, free from all sin, free from death, free from suffering and guilt and shame and sadness and pain and strife. I have staked my eternal future on the fact that Jesus knew what he was talking about. 
On what do you stake your eternal future? To whom have you been listening? Whom are you following, trusting, and obeying? How can a person be sure that he is a believer? What does a person have to do to be sure that she will have eternal life? What does a person have to do in order to be forgiven by God? What does he have to do to know the the wonderful peace that Jesus can bring? Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, Unless you repent, you will all perish too. That's what the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day really needed to do. That's what all of us need to do. We need to repent of our sins. We need to acknowledge our sins, to confess them, and to renounce those sinful ways. If we've been going the wrong way of following sin and and temptation, by God's grace, working in our hearts through his word, through the sacraments, his spirit turns us around from that sinful way and turns us into following in the right direction, to following him and his word. He starts us on a new and wonderful exhilarating Christian life, living for him. So listen to the voice of your good shepherd. Listen and believe. And on that point, the Bible says that faith is not just knowing certain facts about God and about Jesus and and what he did during his life on earth and what he's doing now. No, the Bible says that faith is different from just knowing some facts and details. Faith is a, a trust and a total reliance that Jesus is my personal Savior and that he is absolutely the only way that I will be rescued from sin and that I will receive eternal life in heaven. Jesus, our good shepherd, calls on us to listen to his voice and to follow him together with the fellowship of believers here in the church. Are you listening to him? Are you trusting him, fully relying on him and only him for eternal life? My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. May God grant that we always listen to the voice of our good shepherd Jesus and follow him to eternal life. Amen.